weekly wrap up time and I have nothing but five star reads, which is kind of amazing. Um, so I'm, let's just jump into it. I'm going to start with the one DNF I have and I'm only mentioning it because I talked about it in the past. Got to just got to wrap this up. Um, DNFing Same Bed, Different Dreams by Ed Park. Um, I picked this up because it was a Pulitzer Prize uh, shortlist finalist. Um, I never got past that. I mean, I read another maybe like 40 pages. So I got up to page 112. And this just isn't doing it for me. I can see how experimental it is. I can see why it got a lot of attention, why it got enough attention that it was, you know, it came to the Pulitzer board. But it just is not doing it for me. My brain is not gelling well. I'm not really into the project of this. So I um, gave it a decent try, but it is not for me. So I DNF'd it because I would have just slogged my way through this, unfortunately. And I really wanted to like it because it sounds very interesting. But we just got to set stuff aside. Life is too short to be reading books that we don't like. First five star of the week of... No, it's been longer than a week since I actually did a weekly wrap up. I did my monthly wrap up in between my last weekly wrap up because I didn't read as much in the last couple of weeks. So um, I did read God of the Woods and I did that in my monthly wrap up. So I, that's the only one that I didn't talk about in a weekly wrap up. But um, starting, I kicked off my August strong with a reread because I was feeling very slumpy after how garbage the July ended. So I reread one of my favorite books of all time from one of my favorite series of all time. This is Immortal Beloved by Kate Tiernan. The trilogy is called the Immortal Beloved Trilogy. Now, <laughs> I love this book, but I understand that it's not necessarily the best book. This is one of those where I just really love it and I have such an emotional connection and tie to it that I just, it's a comfort read. I love the characters. I love the world. I love the writing, everything about this. I love the main character, Nastasia. She has a place in my heart. So like, I love this book so much that I read this in one, two and a half hour sitting. Like it's, um, it's a decent sized book. Oh, it has no page numbers. Oh, it does. Okay. 200 and about 300 pages. Um, and I, don't know that I would recommend this. It was it was released in 2010. It was at the height of the like new adult, you know, new adult fantasy kind of coming out. It's it reads very 2010s. Um, but I love it. I've loved it ever since I picked it up in 2012 and finished the trilogy then. Reread re it a few a few different times over the years. Um and this is one book series where I always hesitate to bring it up as a favorite. <laughs> Say hi, it's still rolling. I'm so sorry, I completely <laughs> forgot. He feels really bad, but it's all good. Um, where was I? Um I love this book series. I hesitate to recommend it to anybody because this is one of those things where I can't hear anybody talk bad about it. I don't want to know. If you read it and you don't like it, don't tell me. <laughs> I, I just don't tell me um, this book is too close to my heart to hear anything about it, especially like separate from something like Lord of the Rings or something like that. Like I just I have so much emotional connection to this book that I just I if you decide to read it, if you check it out, I'll be so happy. If you don't like it, please don't tell me. <laughs> OK, um, but yeah, that kicked off um, five star reread. It's always a five star reread for me. So that kicked off August uh, perfectly, which then somehow also kicked off the rest of my all five star reads for the last like week and a half, which was, um, see, I love this book. It does good things for me. Um, the next book I read, I read on audio and it is a classic and that is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. Now, let me preface this by saying somehow in the entirety of my life, I have never been spoiled for this book, which I am shocked by. I keep seeing it like mentioned in like posts on Reddit and stuff like that where people are like I need to talk about this then they allude to something but I've never actually been properly spoiled for it and it's kind of a testament to you know people who are sensitive to trying to keep you know the reveal of the mystery under wraps that I haven't been spoiled and I'm honestly shocked that I haven't because what happens in this book kind of it's one of those like it kicks off a specific a certain trope 
And it was kind of amazing not knowing that trope and just having the ride of my life going along this mystery. Um, it's a Hercule Poirot mystery, it's Agatha Christie, it's a classic, it's a, considered one of her best mysteries, and I can see why now. Um, it's a locked room mystery, uh, it's just there's so much going on here. Essentially, um, this is book four in the Poirot series, but in this book um, Poirot has retired to the small village and um, a murder occurs and um, one of the family members of the, mur of the murdered, murder victim asks Poirot to help discover who did it. Um, there's lots of suspects, there's lots of motives, um, but it's great. I, I don't, I don't want to say anything more than that because if you know, you know. If you don't, I am not going to be the one to spoil something like this for you. Um, but I, I kind of like when I first finished it, I was just maybe at like a 4, 4.5. But I was like, okay, I've seen so many posts about this in the past. So I went, I read, re I read more reviews. I read a lot of Reddit posts and discussions in the past. And I was like, the more I read it, the more I understood the context of what Agatha Christie did and how it affected everything that came after. I just like, it just went back up. It, it's gone up to a five star for me. Like, it's just like, uh, it was fantastic. Um, it was a really enjoyable read. Her murder mysteries always are and just, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I am so happy and so lucky that I've never been spoiled for this, which I don't know, maybe that's a shock to you. It's a shock to me because <laughs> after I found out the, the murderer, I was like, how have I never been spoiled for this? But um, so yeah, I'm very happy to have that as another five star. My next read was The Woods All Black by Lee Mandelo. Now, last year, I really loved Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo, another um, kind of like near future sci-fi um dark story from novella from them from him and um when i heard this was coming out i loved feed them silence so i was like you know i bought it pretty much on day one and i'm very glad i did i'm very glad i enjoyed this as much as i did especially when some of the um the setup and the tropes in here maybe not my favorite it feels kind of gothic-y which i don't like um gothic is not a buzzword that works with me um but um, the setup is essentially um, post-World War One, another time period that I'm not a fan of, um, but I trust Lee Mandela's writing. So post-World War I, um, this American nurse, um, his name is Leslie. Leslie is a trans man and he was in the nursing corps um, on the front in Europe and um, just saw a lot of shit over there and then kind of explored being uh, more open in Paris after the war and then came back to the US and to keep being useful and doing something, Leslie joined the the Frontier Nursing Service. So they send nurses out to communities that really need more medical attention, um, vaccinations, help with childbirth, stuff like that. Um, Leslie does kind of dress more um, masculine than most people are comfortable with but a lot of like the struggle here is actually you know, i'm getting ahead of myself leslie is sent to a small rural small 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 community in rural appalachia and they're um they go alone and as soon as they get there they can tell something's off um it's such a small community they are not welcomed properly like um even though the community asked for a nurse they it's the, they get a hostile greeting um and then leslie does their best to try to bring back more feminine aspects to them to himself um to try to ingratiate themselves better in the community but um there's also this young trans boy teen who is also being ostracized and really um going through a lot that leslie sees and kind of gets tangled up in and um he feels like he has to try to help him along with the community as much as he can before he gets run out of town by the people who don't want him by the pastor who kind of has the community by the balls um this was a great really really great historical fiction setting novel. It was a great look at trans people of this time period, how they kind of interacted in the world and survived in the world and had their own 
sort of their, they had their own community, um, which Leslie leaves behind when he's going to this rural community. And a lot of what Leslie does, like sometimes when characters are like, oh, I need to stay against my better judgment and my safety to help people because I just feel I need to, the fact that the other character, the boy, the teenager, um, Stevie, is also trans really gives a lot more emotional heft to Leslie's desire to stay and try to help along with wanting to do their actual nursing. So the push and pull of the community and Leslie um, medicine versus religion. Um, there's even another like a pregnant woman who Leslie wants to help, but her family doesn't want like interference, stuff like that. And it's just such a laser focus on a small community on this one character and um, how everything like kind of comes together in a powder keg. Um, there's also some weird monster shit going on. Um, there's creepy stuff going on in the woods, you know, something's lurking in the woods, something's happening out there. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that because a lot of what is going on in here is kind of like great to unfold as you read. Um, from what I've said, just any trigger, any content warning that you can think of that relates to that, it's there. Homophobia, transphobia, ra uh, racism, misogyny. Um, there is sexual assault and rape off, off page. Um, unwanted pregnancies, mentions of abortion, um, childbirth, issues with childbirth. It just the, it runs the whole gamut. But um, it is also erotic. I will put it in there. There is some erotic scenes in here, but it's all tastefully done. It's all so well put together. Mandela's writing is so good. So um, after Feed Them Silence and this, I kind of want to go back and read their first book, um, Summer Suns. And um, I'm a Lee Mandela fan. They are now an autobi author for me. So five stars. Um, go check this out if it sounds interesting. Very worth your time. Next is In the Shadow of the Fall by Toby Ogundarin. Um, grab this because it sounded interesting and I had read Toby Ogundaran's short story in I think um, Africa Risen was a speculative anthology I read a year or two ago. Um, they, he had one of my favorite stories in that anthology. So I was very interested in this. Very glad I grabbed it. Very glad I read it out of nowhere. Um, this is essentially a um, African mythology inspired um, fantasy novella. It is um, essentially a story of this acolyte, um, Ashake. She's an acolyte for this religious order where they are trained up to become priests. And when they reach the point where they're supposed to become a priest, they have to go through, they have to go through something where they would then hear the voice of the gods of the, why am I blanking? What is the name of the gods? Um, the Orisha, the Orisha, or the West African gods that this is pulling from. Um, but Ashake has, is five years beyond when normal acolytes move to priests and she has never heard from the gods. And she's so desperate that we open the novella with her going out and performing um, a very highly, I guess, illegal spell to try to make the Orisha speak to her so she can figure out, so she can ask them why she has never been chosen. And everything kind of unravels from there. We follow Ashake as she begins to unravel and discover why she has never been spoken to by the gods. Um, and as we go along the way, the um, the world building is really well done. Like we're learning things with Ashake and a lot of stuff is being filled out um, alongside her little journey in this novel, in this novella. Um, there are a couple of interludes that open up the world a lot more and actually open up a lot more of the conflict that Ashake stumbles into. Um, so there is going to be a second novella. I don't know how long the series is going to go, but there's definitely going to be a second one. And I just really liked it. I do think that some people who have mentioned it feels a little too YA, that criticism does make sense to me. But I just, I kind of accepted it for what it was. Like, Ashake is young. She is. There's no getting around that. Um, and I just, I liked it. It was really fun. Really great, you know, non-Western mythology. Um, it's a great little story. Um, I do wish we had a little bit more with side characters, secondary tertiary characters. 
I feel like m almost all of the character work went into a shake and left um, a lot of the others, like one or two of them got a little bit, you know, character work. You got a good um, color of who they were, but I wish a little bit more was put into that character work in the world. Um, but this ended in a great place, a very interesting, intriguing place. And I am just so curious about where this is going to go. Um, when this scene happens, this scene that happens, this does happen in the book, in the novella. And it was a lot of, it was just great. It was really great. So, um, highly recommend this. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, it was just a great read. So another five star. My last five star just finished this last night and I'm so happy that it was exactly what I needed. The Spell Shop by Sarah Beth Durst. Look at this absolutely amazing, beautiful cover and these beautiful lavender edges. It's just, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, a little bit more. Look at that. They're just, it's so beautiful. And I'm so happy that this is cozy fantasy done right. When it comes to cozy fantasy, Sarah Beth Durst understood the assignment. A plus 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 plus. Um, this is the kind of book that you get this and everything else gets graded on a curve because this is just so good. I like this even more than Legends and Lattes. Now, Cozy Fantasy, I think after Legends and Lattes came out, there were a lot of like Legends and Lattes clones. Um, the Spell Shop takes the bones of what Legends and Lattes laid down and builds its own thing. And Sarah Beth Durst knows exactly how to do cozy fantasy with low stakes but not so low that it's boring i think that was a main if anybody had real criticism about legends and lattes it felt like there was no plot or the stakes were there were no like low stakes or the stakes just didn't feel realistic or not realistic um they didn't feel like there's no tension in legends and lattes there really isn't there's a tiny tiny bit but it's not really tension here there is a little bit more tension but it's not really anxiety inducing tension it's tension from an outside perspective and it makes sense why it's happening and it's just the way everything is dealt with like because the way everything is set up here it's cozy you know everything's going to work out great but the way everything is dealt with and worked out is just even lovelier than I could have hoped for so this is a story about uh Kila who is a it's this is set in a fantasy world where Kila used to grow up on the small island and when she was young her parents moved to the big capital city island and there because they wanted a better um a, a different kind of life for Kila more opportunities for her so she grew up on that city and she ended up becoming a librarian for this great library she's really become very socially introverted she lived in the library she never really saw anyone she has a best friend who is a spider plant named Kaz he is lovely I love Kaz and um there's revolution brewing in this world and Keela and Kaz kind of have to flee the library once the revolutionaries kill the emperor and just start burning everything down and the library starts to burn so they had kind of been preparing but didn't really believe that anything would happen to them or the library so they escape with like five crates of books spell books and not knowing what to do Keela decides to go back to her home island of a uh, cal tree cal tree cal Frey. Oh my god, the island is so important, but I can't remember the name. That's so silly. I literally just finished it yesterday. What is my brain doing? I did an escape room today. I'm going to blame it on the escape room. I've been up a long time. I did a lot of driving, so I'm going to blame it on that. Caltry. Caltry. So Keela goes back to Caltry, and she thinks she can just kind of sneak back in, go back to her parents' old cabin, and live in the house, and pretend and not see anybody, and, not, and just survive on her own. But her neighbor... Who ends up being the love interest Lauren immediately notices that somebody has come into the cabin that nobody has lived in for like 20 years so um she then f realizes she has no food she needs to figure out how to make a living all this kind of stuff so with Lauren helping her uh, insinuate it just kind of being a good person a kind person he kind of like forces his way into her life not in a bad way they do have some awkwardness at the start both of them like he remembers her from when he was a, when he when they were children but she doesn't and because she has a lot of like social anxiety and social awkwardness like they kind of like rub each other the wrong way but they immediately 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 say something like they like um boundaries are set and discussed apologies are made um i just and they move they slowly move forward like figuring each other out and how to be 
with like friends and then eventually the romance is very slow burn it's very sweet um it's not like it's so different like this is this is from uh tor's bramble imprint which is their romance romance sci-fi fantasy romance imprint but i honestly the romance is not the point in this like it's one part of keela coming to realize what life is like what life could be like on the island and what life could be like with people around her and with friends and a love interest but mainly with friends with a community who is there for her and what it's like to be and connect with people again and it's just so lovely she makes jam um kaz is a spider plant who is her friend there's a lot of love for the land and the world this is set in um there are many humans which like you think in your mind keela's a human but she has blue skin and blue hair um laren i maybe i glossed over it because i kind of glossed over keela's description at, at first too and then all of a sudden i was like wait wait, wait she has blue skin <laughs> laren i don't remember what skin color he has but he has like really intense eyes um, a lot of the other villagers, like, one dude has wings and big deer antlers, another one, the baker, has, like, smaller antlers, one's a centaur, Kaz is a, a seahorse herder, like, just so much going on. There are mermaids, so this is such a, like, a colorful fantasy world that is just so interesting, and I loved it. It was exactly the coziness I needed, it had exactly the right amount of outside tension that I needed. The setup was great. The lovely descriptions of the land and the baking and the jam making. It was just lovely. The Kila making friends, everybody coming together as a community. The little bits like when the tension and plot comes back in, it kind of expands the world a little bit. Like it was just, it's just so lovely. I just, I really loved it. It was exactly what I needed. If it sounds interesting to you, if you want to give cozy, like if you like cozy fantasy, this is top tier cozy fantasy to me. To me, this is top tier cozy fantasy. Um, I, I like it even more than Legends of Lattes. Like Travis Baldry laid the groundwork for the current certain of uh, cozy fantasy and Sarah Beth Durst just reached new fucking heights with it. This is just perfect. Um... And it's such a pretty book. I'm so glad that this lived up to just how absolutely gorgeous this book is. Um, this is going to be in my top favorites of the year. I just, I loved it. I just loved it so much. And I hope y'all read it and love it as much too. If you love it half as much as I did, you will have a good time. Um, so yeah, The Spell Shop, um, my last five star of this last week. That's all I got. I'm currently reading. I'm not really like I did... I'm still technically currently reading Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson, but I haven't touched it in a couple of weeks. Um, I am still currently reading Tower of Thorns by Juliette Marillier. I haven't touched that in a week or so. Um, I have a few library books that I picked up as part of like um, this project I want to do, reading a lot of um, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, International Booker Prize and Pulitzer Prize. Well, I guess Pulitzer Prize not anymore. That's gone. Um, but just reading some of those short lists. Uh, but I'm just not... I, I, I don't know what to pick up. I don't know if I want to go in that direction, especially after I finished the spell shop and that was exactly what I needed. But so, um, honestly, I'm probably just going to pick up the next Immortal Beloved book and just keep this high going. Um, let's see. My laptop just shut down. K-pop song of the week is going to be uh, No Sense by Sam Kim. This is a really lovely guitar-led song he is an amazing singer and he does not have even a quarter of the accolades and acclaim and popularity that he deserves so go check it out link is down below as always thank you for watching and i will catch you next time bye